we have been doing a study on the Johns in the Bible. Call Me John is what we've called the series. We're in the midst of it. There are at least five Johns in the Bible, but there are two that we are going to look at. We've looked at John the Baptist, and this morning we're going to consider John the Apostle. An interesting man as we consider him. The Lord Jesus Christ referred to he and his brother as sons of thunder and immediately as you think about that the image should come to your mind that they were probably fairly angry young men and so today as we come to look at the apostle john we're going to learn from his life the cure for anger because if the lord could change john and his brother james who were angry young men he can change any of us and I think all of us if we were honest with ourselves there are times that we feel a deep anger over certain things and it comes upon us and we think Lord why this isn't me and so I want us to be encouraged today as we look at uh, John the Apostle's life so that we can see that the Lord can change our hearts so that the anger that can come upon us can be changed. Without being too extensive on this, I want you to understand the background of John the Apostle because you may be familiar with the New Testament, but uh, you might not have studied the different characters in the Bible. Of course, uh, the Apostle John and his brother James were, were two of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from the Scriptures that uh, they were sons of Zebedee, Zebedee had a fisherman business. They were fishers on the Sea of Galilee. It's also interesting, as we'll see in a moment, that probably through their mother's side, they were related to the priests in Israel. Rather interesting mix when you think about that. The other interesting character that I want you to consider for a moment is for John and James, their mother was a lady called Salome. And uh, she was like any good Jewish mother. She wanted to see her sons lifted up and she made a request that her sons would have an important position in the kingdom of the Lord. And so the Lord had to give some teaching about that those who want to lift themselves up will be last. And those that put themselves last, the Lord will lift up. But it gets a little bit more detailed, and this is why I didn't give you the whole family tree. We believe from studies that we can do with the scripture and from some other background that there were three sisters in Israel and their father was a priest of Israel. One of those we know from the scripture, Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist. Another one we know her name, but we're just simply going to call her sister. She was the mother of Salome. And then from there, there on you go down to the Apostle John and the Apostle James. Then you have another sister who we believe was the mother of Mary. And of course Mary was the mother of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting when you think about that because you realise then that there are close connections and there are other connections that the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ had, other disciples that they, that they had with with the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can understand, therefore, here is John and his brother James. They are in the midst of a fairly close relationship with the other disciples and, humanly speaking, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is not unusual because uh, the Israelites were a fairly small community and they were connected to each other. The interesting thing with, with John the Apostle, we read from John chapter 1 that he had been a follower of John the Baptist. He would have clearly known him on many levels. He'd been a follower of John the Baptist, but then soon after we read in John chapter 1, he along with, with Peter and Andrew began to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They certainly would have known of him, but now they are beginning to see him as the Son of God. So it gives you a bit of a glimpse into the background of, of John and his brother James. And perhaps the, the importance that they would have felt that because of their relationship, that they should have 
greater giftings from the Lord Jesus Christ, if we want to put it that way. But our text, our main text that I want us to look at today is I want you to, to get a glimpse of the way that John was, and James, his brother, was obviously the same, to get a glimpse of what they were like. It's interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ named them in Mark chapter 3 and verse 17 as the sons of thunder. So he saw the anger in these young men. And so you have this account that we'll pick up in Luke in chapter 9 and we'll see here how easily these young men, John and James, were angered. It says in verse 51, Now it came to pass... When the time had come for him to be received up, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to there, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, probably James and John, John and James. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Picture the scenario here. The Lord Jesus Christ is travelling with his disciples. They are, are going through the area of Samaria. And the Lord Jesus Christ, because he has something important to do, he's going down to Jerusalem. And yet he's asked that messengers be sent ahead so that they could find a place to stay. But the Samaritans, as they look at the Lord Jesus Christ, they look at his face, and it seems to, to, to them that he's going to continue onward so they don't receive him. And so you can see what is happening here. There is a misunderstanding, isn't there? There's a misunderstanding. What about you and I? Often, if we're not careful, we can misunderstand others and their intentions, and before we know it, we can become full of anger. And it's implied here that this is what happened with John and James. They were sons of thunder. James the Apostle was a son of thunder, easily angered, easily angered. But the next thing that you see as you continue on, and maybe you have felt like uh, what it says here in the Scripture, but you've never been able to put it into action, praise God. It says there in verse 54, it says, and when his disciples, James and John, John the Apostle, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Can you imagine that, the audacity of that? Just because of a misunderstanding. Lord, they shouldn't have treated you like that. So, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven? It's not that they could do that, but in their hearts they wanted to do it. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, there are times in the secret recesses of our heart when somebody has ill-used us or we've misunderstood somebody and they've shown anger or resentment towards us, we think, Lord, if only you could strike them with fire from heaven, then my problems would all be over. And so within us, so easily there is this quickness to avenge when we are hurt or misunderstood. Also you can see that there was a lack of understanding on their part. You look there at verse 55, it says, But he turned, the Lord Jesus Christ turned, and he rebuked them. He rebuked them. It seems almost that they felt that they had some power because of the relationship, some power because that they were disciples, but he turns and rebukes them. I'm sure they stood up and took notice of this and he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Totally lacking in understanding of the situation. And I wonder how many times we have been angered at others because we totally misunderstand the situation instead of being prayerful and looking into it. And so the Lord had to rebuke them, sometimes even has, as he has to rebuke us. What manner of spirit are you that you would want somebody to be struck by fire from heaven? What manner of spirit are you, you sons of thunder? 
And so you see here in the Word of God, it mentions in 56, this desire that they had to destroy and how the Lord rebuked that. For the Son of Man, in other words, the Lord Jesus Christ, did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know, when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Saviour, there should be nothing in our heart that would want to destroy others. That should be that which is of the past life. The more we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the less we should want to destroy others in any way at all. Because the Lord Jesus Christ makes it clear that he came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And that should be our heart. How much that should be our heart. I think about the destructiveness that can come upon people before they are saved and yet sometimes it is in our own hearts it should never be taking you back to a time when i was in papua new guinea i remember i was asked to be part of the ordination committee of a young man about 30 years old and the church had desired that he would be their new pastor the pastor uh, was uh, a man that in his previous background as a teenager he was destructive. In fact, he was involved with a murder. And I had to be a part of that ordination committee. What would you do? How would you feel if the man that you were voting in as pastor, that in his teen years, it was known that he was a murderer. He would tried to destroy lives. In fact, he had destroyed a life. Now, this was brought up in the committee and we discussed it and we prayed about it. And the question I asked, well, is this man changed? He'd been 10 years in the church, saved in his late teens, but murdered in his, in his mid-teens. And they said, yes, pastor, he has changed. We've seen the fruit of his life. We've seen that one who tried to destroy is now one who has a heart of love for the people. And so he was accepted as the pastor. And I thought, that's no different from the Apostle Paul, is it? It shows the work that the Lord can do. And we're going to see how that the Lord changes the Apostle John's heart from being a destructive man, a son of thunder, to become known as what we often think of him today as the Apostle of Love. And if I said to you, John, the apostle of love, you probably heard that, but you haven't heard too much about him being the son of thunder, and that is because he changed. And I want us to get a glimpse this morning of how it is that he changed, because as we see how he changed, it can cause a change in our lives. And I believe if we can quickly go through some scenes today, we will see the difference that came to John's life was that he was amazed at the love that the Lord Jesus Christ had for him. He knew he was a son of thunder. He knew that he had desired to destroy, but he became amazed at the love that the Lord had for him, so much so that when he writes... His gospel, the gospel of John, do you know what he refers to himself over and over again as? As the disciple that the Lord Jesus Christ loved. Because he was overwhelmed with that. And you know, if he's referring to that and seeing himself as the disciple that the Lord Jesus Christ loved, it's because he fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ so much that all of this destructiveness, all of this anger faded away. And I believe in many respects you see the Lord working in his heart sooner and in a greater way than the other disciples. And so I know I need to move quickly and, and I can only just give some of the background, but I, I just want you to see how that John described as the disciple that the Lord Jesus loved. I want you to see some of the background and so you can enter into some of the intimacy and the love that he felt for the Lord Jesus Christ. Picture the scene if you can. Not long before the, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
The Lord Jesus Christ has gathered his disciples around for supper. And the Lord Jesus Christ reveals who it is that's going to betray him. It's interesting, Peter, because he's not exactly sitting close to the Lord Jesus Christ the way that John, the beloved disciple, was. What does he do? We read it here in the Scriptures. Peter asks the question of John. He, he says, can, can you ask the Lord Jesus Christ who it is that's actually going to betray him? And we get a glimpse into John's life because what do you see John here doing? It says that he was leaning on Jesus' bosom, in other words, his chest. Leaning back, reclining next to him. I, I believe that it wasn't a, an act of possession. It was just a desire in his heart. He wanted to be as close as he could to the Lord Jesus Christ. Physically, we are unable to do that. But leaning on Jesus has a thought that we just want to trust in him in every thing we do and say we want to come to the word to seek him in a greater way so that we can be close to him as possible to fall in love with him in a greater way but what a beautiful glimpse you have there the disciple that jesus loved leaning on the lord jesus christ so that he could hear the lord's response peter wasn't as close as that physically at that time, so he couldn't hear the response. And this becomes an important thought later on. I want to set another scene. You come to the scene of the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ crucified for us, dying on the cross for us. Did you know all of the other disciples had fled? Except for John. Think about that for a moment. Why was he still there when all the others have fled? I think it's because he was so much in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, so much thinking about how much the Lord Jesus loved him. He just couldn't leave his Saviour, even when his Saviour was dying on the cross. And we can see the intimacy of that moment from the, the quote that we have here in that the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he is dying, is asking for an obedient act on behalf of John. Look at what the scripture has to say there, there in, in John chapter 19. It says there, when Jesus therefore saw his mother as he's dying on the cross, and the disciple, which is John the apostle, whom he loved, standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Can you picture the scene? There is John. There is Mary at the foot of the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to his mother Mary, this is your son. This is your son. John is the one that I want to take care of you. And look at the words as they continue. Then he said to the disciple, John, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. An act of obedience even there at the cross. The Lord gave that responsibility to John because he knew how much he loved the Lord. And from that time on, history tells us that it continued on for many, many years. He took care of Mary. An act of obedience as a result of the, the love that he had for the Lord. Picture another scene, scene three. The morning of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene, she sees the stone has been rolled away. She rushes off to tell the disciples. And then you have a running race. And we find out from the scriptures there that, that John was faster than Peter. I don't know why he was faster than Peter, but he was. But when they came to the, the empty tomb, John stood back for a little while and Peter went in and then John went in. And we pick up some of the thought here, particularly there in verse 8. Then the other disciple, who is John, John the beloved disciple, the one whom the Lord Jesus loved, he came to the tomb first. He went in also. 
So John and Peter came to the, the tomb. John came first, but then Peter went in, and then John went in after. And it says there, when John went in, when he went in and he saw the grave clothes in there laid out in the tomb, it says that he believed. When he saw, he believed. And in many respects, I believe that he was the first of the disciples to truly believe. He saw and recognized that the Lord Jesus Christ was not only his, his saviour who had died, but he was the risen saviour. And I think he understood first because he was one that loved the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he understood the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for him. Oh, brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to understand that. We come to another scene, scene four. Some days later, the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected, but he's told the disciples that they are to go up to the Sea of Galilee. And so they decide to go fishing. And as they come in towards the shore, yes, the Lord gives them a miracle so that they're able to, to, to get some fish. But they did not recognize that it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is it that recognises first? Has his eyes opened? Who is it that recognises that it's the Lord Jesus Christ? It's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I think part of the explanation for that was he loved the Lord Jesus Christ so much that he recognised him first. And if we love the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart and soul and mind, we will recognise him in the events of our daily life. Let's look at the scripture that we have there before us. It says, therefore, that disciple that Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, he says, it's the Lord. Peter hasn't recognized it's the Lord yet, but John does. And he helps Peter see that it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard, when he heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and he plunged into the sea. John's probably a little bit slow in getting to the Lord, but he's the one who recognises it's the Lord, the one who loves him. Scene five. And it's really the same part of the scene that you, you find there in John chapter 21. You're welcome to look at the passage if you like. We know from John chapter 21 that the Lord deals with, with Peter by the Sea of Galilee Peter, because he's denied the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is in a rather messy state, if we can put it that way. He feels that the Lord Jesus Christ may not accept him, but he sees how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves him, and the Lord gives the command to Peter, follow me. But there's something else that's going on. And I'll read the verse that we have before us, John 21 and verse 20. But picture this scene, the Lord Jesus Christ is obviously walking with Peter. Giving Peter assurance that just because he denied the Lord does not mean that the Lord does not have something for him. Giving Peter assurance. But pick this up there in verse 20 of 21. Then Peter turning around. He saw who? The disciple, John whom the Lord Jesus loved, what was he doing? He was following. Who also had leaned on his breast at the supper. Now you can imagine this scene. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ walking along with Peter, reconciling Peter unto himself, and all of a sudden Peter looks around and there is John following. And the question I would ask, why is John following? Why is he in on the scene? It's not that he's wanting to listen to the conversation. He just wants to be near the Lord. And it should be the same for you and I. We cannot follow him physically, but in our hearts, is it all about the Lord Jesus, the one that we know that loves us? And do we just want to follow him? So that it almost seems that we get in the way. And you can almost feel a sense of resentment in Peter's voice when, when he's asked the question, well, what, does, what do you want of this man? What is this man going to do, Lord? What is John going to do? 
And basically the Lord says to Peter, mind your own business, but the whole point is, I see that Peter was somewhat resentful that John was getting in the way. He was following close behind. And that's the way we should be. Growing up, I had a kid brother. He still is a kid brother, even though he's, he's in his 50s. And it seemed wherever you went, he was five years younger, he would get in the way. And it wasn't that he desired to get in the way, but it just seemed that he would get in the way. He was always wanting to follow and sometimes you would resent that. There came a day as a 17 year old I was about to fly across to Bible College in America and I still remember the tears in my brother's eyes and and just, just crying his heart out because I as the older brother was leaving And it opened my eyes to the love that he had for me. And why it was that he got in the way and why he wanted to follow because he just wanted to be by me. And I see the same thing here with John. His heart has changed. He's never the same because he just wants to be with the Lord Jesus. He wants to follow. Going from that son of thunder, that angry young man, heart changed because he falls in love with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, Lord, we cannot lean on the the chest of the Lord Jesus Christ physically. We cannot follow him physically. But Lord, in our hearts we can do these things by putting the Lord Jesus first and loving him more and more day by day so that, Lord, our constant desire rather than to destroy lives would be to love others because of the love that we have for you. This is your heart. Lord, thank you that we are about to sing a song that reminds us of the fact that we are loved with everlasting love and that we can recognise like John the Apostle that we are his and he is mine. And Lord, I pray that we'll never grow tired of that thought. Lord, that we, if we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, are those whom the Lord Jesus Christ loves. And so therefore, Lord, I pray we would respond to that love and go from being sons and daughters of thunder, desiring to destroy, desiring to avenge, but Lord, to have a heart of love because we're overwhelmed with the love that you have for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.